to thank you all for coming out on this uh, dreary afternoon Come to join us for um, the first screening of Workers. This is a film that's the result of uh, several years collaboration between the artist Petra Bauer and Scott Pepp, a uh, sex worker-led organisation based in Scotland. And the film it was produced by Collective and her film. And I'd like to thank uh, the Film House for hosting us today. Um, the film was uh, made through in Glasgow at the Scottish Trade Union Congress. And uh, in the film, as sex workers occupy the building, a series of conversations unfold, uh, which centre the voices of the workers as they demand to be seen as experts on their own lives. Uh, the film's about 40 minutes long, and afterwards we will be introducing the people who made the film, followed by a panel discussion where we will be uh, taking questions from the audience, so you can uh, have a think about anything you want to ask. And um, we'll be going straight into the film now, so uh, I hope you enjoy it. We demand that sex workers are treated as experts on their own lives. We demand the full decriminalisation of sex work in order that we may work in safety, whether outdoors, for a manager, or with friends. We demand that sex workers of all genders, and regardless of immigration status, be given health care free a point of access. We demand resources from others and other carers whose crucial reproductive labor underpins everything else and yet who frequently struggle with poverty and marginalization. We demand sex work be accepted as work. We demand full labor rights for sex workers. We stand in solidarity with all other workers. We demand the redistribution of the world's resources on the basis of need, not profit. I also sometimes feel that people don't even understand the link between migration and sex work. Um, I would never go and speak publicly as myself, but sometimes when I have to do it as part of Scott Pep, um, my identity as a migrant never even comes into it. Um, that conversation. Mm. Um, and I don't, when that happens, I don't really feel like pointing it out into people's faces because I don't want to draw too much attention to myself. Yeah. So, like, the organization kind of gives you, uh, I mean, makes it safe for you. Yeah, it so gives me a cover, it makes it safer for me, but at the same time, it current set aspects of my life which in a way pushed me into sex work in the first place mm. so it erases something that really needs to be looked into if you want to make all sex workers safer mm. i don't think they are actually listening to sex workers and i think that they have like um they have ideology mm -hmm. and they're only listening to sex workers that back up what their ideology is mm -hmm. um, and yeah I just thought that was um, kind of a dangerous thing to do you know mm -hmm. they're not really looking at what is actually happening mm -hmm. um, like the reality it sounds like it's quite an intense transition for you both in my yeah it was I mean um, yeah I guess that's what we talked about was um you know, I was saying they were having an emotional reaction to it, and and I don't think that emotion has a place when you're trying to make policy. Um, but she seems to think it was me that was having the emotional reaction, <laughs> well, which was are. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I guess, I don't know, like, I think there's a, a real kind of um, disconnect of priorities with the topic of, like, prostitution, where sex workers, you know, come to be this kind of symbol. And, and then, you know, for, for non-sex working women, where we, you know, have this kind of symbolic or metaphorical function. Yeah. That means that the conversation gets stuck in kind of it is quite kind of representational space of like right. what does it mean that some women sell sex yeah um what does sex work symbolize mm-hmm. when actually uh, for women who do sell sex you know there's so much yeah. that's kind of a real kind of material emergency you know yeah. like people being arrested people being deported yeah. people being evicted you know and we that really gets kind of sidelined and these concerns yeah. which should I think be central to the conversation become marginal and these kind of more marginal concerns about representation become central. How's uh, your work been going? Have you been busy recently? Um, well, it tends to get quiet in the summer, but yes, it picks up recently. Especially the last few days. You know, I really appreciate when people can respond to emails on time, it just makes things easier and they mm-hmm. communicate openly. Yeah, that's yeah, so cool. Yeah, but that's probably not something you miss. How long has it been now that you've been off work? Uh, it's been a, been a few months now. It's been since March that stopped. So, yeah, it's been good. I've been really enjoying having having a bit of a break from work. <laughs> what made you decide to take a break? Um, I just got a bit fed up, really. Yeah. And, yeah, because I've been working you know, pretty much full-time, like non-stop, for several years. Mm-hmm. So yeah, just thought it'd be nice to have a have a break, have yeah. some a bit of a rest. So yeah, I've been really enjoying it, but um, you know it can't, it can't last forever because I have to go back and start earning some money at some point. Do you think yeah. that's going to happen soon? Well, probably later this year, I think. Yeah, mm. we'll see. I just recently moved, so it works a bit tricky for me at the moment. Yeah. I was, yeah, I was um, like traveling back here and trying to squeeze like a month's worth of work into a week, which was yeah. like not sustainable. It's not fun. No, not good it's at all. It was stressful. It was. So I'm kind of, um, you know, taking a break as well while I try and get myself sorted in a new place. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, there's obviously work's just one aspect of moving so there's a lot to deal with um but i know it'll figure itself out in due course so oh, i hope so yeah do you need any help no no it's fine it's absolutely fine yeah it's always a big upheaval moving yeah totally I had to sell all my furniture because I furnished the place myself mm. and uh, he found the ads that I placed online and he started texting me and making comments about, you know, um, about my ads and mm. whether I've already found buyers and and then he kept insisting that he will only give my deposit back on condition that I give him my new address. Mm. I'm not giving my new address to no. a stalker. Not to mention that he obviously didn't lodge my deposit for the schemes. Mm. I mean, I don't know, but he's not supposed to keep my deposit. He's supposed to give it to this authority that oversees yeah. all the land that he's obviously not done that. And theoretically speaking, I know I could take him to court for that, but if I'm doing it myself, I need to make my address public. Mm. I'm not doing that. Do you think he did all this like harassment and things because he knew you were a sex worker? Or? I don't know. Um, right now, um, I feel like uh, it's it's one of those. I uh, gosh, I don't know. Um, he, he started it before he would know anything about me, but because he was constantly watching me coming mm. and going, I think he may well know by now. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, do you feel safe now you've moved yeah. into this new place? It's, um, I think as time goes, I will feel safer there, but it's also in an area where he lives. Mm. Um, and I saw him once walking into a coffee shop across the road, and I went into this panic mode mm. where I didn't know if he just genuinely wanted to drink or yeah. whether he was just planning to sit there and watch me through the windows again. God, didn't, I mean... What do you ever think of reporting them to the police? Um, that kind of behaviour. 
absolutely like that's not an, an option. Um, I went to the police once um, a couple of years ago uh, because I was absolutely desperate. A client uh, assaulted me. I normally wouldn't. Um, I, you know, as an undocumented migrant, uh, you know, the consequences are actually going to be for me and not for whoever I report. But at that time, I felt so bad. I, I felt like if this person does the same to somebody else, he could really ruin someone's mm-hmm. life. Mm-hmm. Um, I went to speak to the police and they just basically laughed at me. Yeah. You know, if they laughed at an assault, what are they, are they really going to take me seriously if yeah. I report harassment mm-hmm. and stalking? That's not going to lead to anything. They're just going to look into my life and not. Yeah. Do you think we'll get a chance to watch the the on occupation film again? I've actually never seen it. It's amazing. I'd love to see it. It's actually. fascinating. It made me cry. Yeah. It's just it's not really it's just raw footage, isn't it? It just kind of starts like literally in the middle of a conversation, then stops in the middle of a conversation. Yeah. The protest over alleged police harassment. Fifteen women, some with children, have locked themselves in Holy Cross Church at King's Cross and say they won't leave until they get guarantees about future police conduct. The church is in a notorious red light area. The women, mainly from the English collective of prostitutes, want the police crackdown on prostitution eased. They claim women are being wrongly arrested, while others have been pressured into admitting soliciting charges. We decided to occupy the church because the situation in King's Cross with the amount of police persecution and harassment of prostitute women that's going on has become so desperate that we wanted to take drastic action to bring it to public attention and to insist that something be done about it. And that's why we're calling for a representative from the Home Secretary's Department. The vicar, the Reverend Trevor Richardson, says the women can stay if they don't interfere with services. But the girls also have Uh, a point to make, I think probably they are harassed, and uh, too much concentration in my mind is directed to the girls themselves and not to the evils of society which caused them to be here in the first place. Scotland Yard say they've had no complaints from the women but say the allegations will be investigated. Women from the English collective of prostitutes who are staging the sit-in asked to go to tonight's meeting but so far they haven't been invited. The news conference held in the church today, they made it clear that a meeting with the local police commander, Frank Chambers, would have to be arranged before they'd consider leaving. They've also demanded a meeting with someone from the Home Office. Sitting with the women was the vicar of Holy Cross, Father Trevor Richardson. He said he'll make no attempt to have the women evicted forcibly, providing services can continue. But some parishioners are angry about his attitude. Very bitter. Very bitter. Because as I say, it's not nice when you go into mass, you want to say your prayers quietly, and you've got prostitutes sitting at the back. I've got a personal friend, I mean, she's been, not, I mean, English, she's college educated, and she's bitter. She said, I'm getting a bit sick every Sunday morning of being told by Father Tre- uh, Trevor about these kind of women. Well, the impression given in certain sections of the press uh, is that the parishioners are all against me. Um, that, in fact, is an absolute misrepresentation. There's undoubtedly some parishioners, though, that would have seemed to have liked you to take a, a firmer stand. What do you say to them? Well, the only possible firmer stand to take would, would in fact, to be to ask the police to remove the women from the church. Frankly, I think that would have created a scene which would have been uh, less in keeping with the teaching of Jesus Christ than what is happening now. Inside the church, the prostitutes have asked for a special mass to be said for them on Sunday. So far, only the normal service is scheduled. The women have promised that they'll be there. This is Steve Clark in King's Cross. Motion by a group of women demanding rights for prostitutes. The protesters, who've donned black masks for fear of being recognised, claim that prostitutes working in the King's Cross area are constantly harassed and victimised by the police. The vicar, Father Trevor Richardson, has so far backed the protest, and so has the Women's Committee of Camden Council. But this sympathy isn't shared by the Holy Cross congregation, who on Sunday had to worship in makeshift surroundings. And as the five-day protest has continued, further criticism has begun to develop over the fact that not all the women sitting in are, in fact, prostitutes. Some are long-time feminist campaigners and have been accused of doing the prostitutes of King's Cross more harm than good. Now, Salma James, you are leading this protest, and you're no, not I'm a. Not, I'm not well, you're one of the, you're one involved. of the leaders, and yeah. you're very heavily involved. Now, you're not a prostitute. How do you, you make know? it sound like that's a crime? I'm just stating the case. Yeah. How do you know, since you aren't a prostitute, 
what the prostitutes of King's Cross really want. Because they say so all the time. They say so to everybody and nobody listens and that's why we took over the church. So now they are hearing. And now people who want to defend the police are attacking those of us who are not prostitutes and those of us who are for putting the case before the public. All right, now there have been some fairly upfront attacks on you, particularly today in some of the national newspapers. Yeah, detail. And it's been pointed out that you're a long-time campaigner for women against rape, wages for housework, housewives in dialogue, black women for wages and so black on. Black women. Fine. Sounds but ominous. Yeah. Were they causes as these, I'm sure, may be? Isn't there a danger that your reputation as a professional adopter of causes might backfire on the girls you're trying to represent and make the public lose sympathy for the girls? I don't earn my living as a, as a backer of causes as you earn your living by questioning people who do have causes. I earn my living uh, as a typist. And I would like to say that every woman is, should be interested in the cause of prostitutes in King's Cross and every person who understands that the police are not doing what they're supposed to be doing and are doing what they're not supposed to be doing, are doing illegal things, should be very interested, very concerned with what we are doing. We're the front line demanding that the police activity in King's Cross and elsewhere be looked into. Some, we're of, the the girls, front line. James, so some of the girls were quoted today as saying that your sit-in at the church had caused the police to crack down even harder. How do you reply to that? I think that that's partly true. I think that many girls are not being arrested and I think that some girls are being arrested more, especially those you know, whom the police can get at. They're very angry when women stand up for their rights and they're doing more illegal work in some areas now than they were before. Well, are you sorry? Well, they in a good thing. It's the yes. police that's causing the police to crack down harder. No, no, the police are doing some more illegal work in some areas and some less illegal work in others. Women walked out of the church today and were threatened with arrest, but they were not arrested because we were with them, those of us who have been publicly identified. There is no way it is a bad thing to point to police illegality if you have a case and we have one. You cannot say that that's unjust. Summer James, there's one final point I'd like to put to you. The idea of campaigning for prostitutes' rights is not a new one. Right. In this country, a body called the Josephine Buckler Society was founded in 1870 that's to protect right. prostitutes' civil rights. And today they told us that they could not support your sit-in. Yes. Why do you think it is that the oldest body in the country to help prostitutes is not supporting you? Because they're not interested in prostitutes. They're careerists who are making their living by saying they're interested and concerned and looking around and doing nothing. Women have come to them for help and they've refused. Selma, thank you very much. I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm sorry to cut you off. Um, it's so interesting. Like, so much of what they say, it could be from from now. Really? Could be, yeah. It's sort, of, it's sort of inspiring. It's sort of depressing. Yeah. Well, yes, that's why I cried because, you know, it was like, what, 40 years ago? And... We haven't even moved anywhere. Like, nothing's changed. Yeah. Like they're talking like about my life. Yeah. God. I listened to um, a little snippet of a radio interview from 1984 in mm -hmm. Australia mm -hmm. yesterday. That was um, someone speaking from what was then the Australian Prostitutes Collective. Yeah. Um, and it was again, it was so disconcerting. Um, she was saying the exact same thing. She was even saying. We want to be clear, we don't want legalisation. They have a form of legalisation in Germany. It just gives the state and bosses more power. We don't want that. What we want is decriminalisation where workers have the power. And it was like, it was almost spooky. It was like the same. Exactly yeah. the same, yeah. What were the demands of the Glean occupation? Is it, you know, get, basically decriminalise us, like, you know... Yeah, it was focused on street-based workers and they wanted an end to... Police harassment, police harassment and fines. Yeah. Um, and it was five churches that were occupied. Five? I, I think so. Yeah. And then also it said that there was up to 20,000 sex workers also kind of downing their tools or really? not working in the same period. Yeah. Um, I don't know how many days it lasted. Wasn't there an occupation in London? A couple of years later. Yeah. 1980 maybe. Yeah. King's Cross, that was like when ACP formed. Okay. Yeah. How did it end? Um, I think they were kicked out of the church. Right. Actually. They, they only occupied the church in King's Cross because they had a good connection with um, the church people who worked um, there. Yeah. And then there's the STU street protest. Mm. I think these pages are the best. They're the most colourful. Yeah, yeah, they're great. Yeah. The umbrellas are great, aren't they? Yeah. What year was that again? 2013. 2013, yeah.
So were you there? Um, yeah, we had we had booked this space for a big um, festival thing uh, with the Sex Work Group University. So then was and um, really soon before, like they um, cancelled on us because they felt that uh, sex work goods weren't in line with their like um, I don't know policy for who could use the space. Right. Well, I won't like, reach that far. I'm like it's their chair. I remember we wrote we wrote an email back saying like because we looked at what they we looked at what they. Uh, said in their response to Rhoda's consultation, which was all about how sex workers are a form of violence and sex workers are victims. And, and we said, well, if, if you believe that, why would you, why would you exclude people you perceive as victims from meeting together and organising mm-hmm. in your space? Um, so there was a real like disconnect between mm-hmm. their words and their actions. I also remember it was Saturday morning when we got to the building for the protest and it was so early and the building was closed because well, it was Saturday morning and the streets were empty because it was Saturday morning and everything was so quiet and we were just standing there screaming outside <laughs> the building. Yeah, we'd, pro- we'd, like, we'd produced the, all the publicity material with the address on and the posters all over the city and um, they, they pulled out at the, the very last minute so we had to find you know, another venue and then get the word out and... Something else that I've only just remembered looking at these photos is that we had loads of trouble getting these signs printed. Do you remember that? Yeah. Because, um, <laughs> yeah, we, we got them printed somewhere and um, multiple, like, print shops said that they wouldn't do it and they wouldn't... They wouldn't it was too, like, contentious. And um, in the end, the place that did do it specifically says, like, don't, don't tell anyone you've got this done here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's in this situation we don't want any publicity <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was really like this double whammy of like you can't meet here you can't have your event here and you also like can't print signs to protest that yeah. I think I think also it's really important to think about like the purpose of end demands is to make sex workers poorer it's like that's literally kind of how the economics of it are supposed to work so you know the the demand reduces, and that means that sex workers who constitute supply will start going, oh, well, this isn't working for me anymore. I guess I should, like, you know, exit the sex industry and, and find something else to do. Mm-hmm. But, like, while that's happening, people people spend a long time, like, becoming poorer. And, like, the more marginalised you are, the longer, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 like, the harder it is for you to just exit the sex industry. Um and, and the longer you spend, you know, kind of scrabbling around for clients, accepting clients that you would otherwise not. Like, I don't know, like a couple, like a couple of years ago, um, my advertising was, like, taken down from the site that I may need because um, it had been incorrectly flagged as spam or something, I don't know. Um, so for, like, about a week, it took about a week to get it back, um, I suddenly had, like, this huge drop in clients mm-hmm. um, and my rent was due at the end of the week. And um, I was, I like, I, I like really experienced this dynamic of like, you have, you know, I remember like in conversation with someone who seemed really pushy, seemed really aggressive, was trying yeah. to like mm-hmm. ne- negotiate me down on condom use and on, on prices and services. And I felt like I had so much more pressure to accept that client because I had no other clients there, you know, yeah. I, I, because of this huge drop in demands, you know. Yeah, I've experienced that. We've probably all experienced that when you're, yeah, something happens and, um, yeah, you know. And that's like the aim of the policy. That's like end demand working how it should yeah. be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, and it feels terrible. Mm-hmm. And it's... And it's scary. And it makes it is frightening, scary. yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, you can reduce... You can reduce the demand, but um, you don't reduce our our living costs. <laughs> That's nobody's really talking about that. Yep. I think the more desperate you were in the first place, then right. So the it hits more marginal sex workers harder and faster. Yeah. 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 yeah if you were really concerned about women and sex workers, then you would 
that would be what the conversation would be about. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to introduce everyone very briefly. So we have at the end here Molly Smith, who is a sex worker and activist and the author of a most amazing book called Revolting Prostitutes. And you is a sex worker and a member of Scott Pepp, who is also an amazing activist, a sex worker and a member of Scott Pepp. The artist Petra Bauer. And also Lee Sylvia Federici, who would, we're honoured to have join us on this panel this evening. So before we begin, I just wanted to say, if anyone's taking any photos, um, please can you, for safe anonymity, cover um, everyone's faces with um, an emoji or not take photos of us. <laughs> <laughs> we have um, time for questions from the audience, but we uh, will begin um, with a few topics that we wanted to discuss today. Um, we also really appreciate comments on the film, but would encourage you to do so in the spirit of generosity and thinking about um, our safety um, here. So the first thing that we really wanted to start talking about is uh, the topic of visibility and really why it's very challenging for sex workers to be visible in public forums such as this and to be visible and listened to in policy debates. So we wanted to talk through that and also address why it's deeply important that they are visible and listened to. So I invite Kat to, to begin. Uh, certainly to talk about visibility and um, I think the question is more of um, invisibility. I, you probably noticed that there weren't any faces in the film until the very end and we are grateful to all the people who felt that they could put their face to this film. Obviously many people couldn't. Um, I think quite often when it comes to sex work, uh, there was always this assumption that only the privileged uh, sex workers um, speak because um, others, you know, usually it's the 95% of sex workers who are not privileged, um, they just don't have the voice and they don't have the means to speak quite often, that's not the case. Quite often it's just because sex workers are too concerned about being outed. Um, and that was one of the main issues in making this film. And this is one of the reasons that um, we, Scott Speck as an organisation, are very grateful to um, making a film uh, with characters in it, uh, but no faces in that city. And when we started work, there were uh, quite a few people who were really interested in the project. There were many people sitting at the table with all the ideas, but as time went on, people realised that actually, much as they really wanted to take part in it and contribute to the film, they couldn't. There was too much um, at risk um, in their lives, and um, that especially applied to people who thought that their accents could be particularly um, recognisable, even if their face is not there. Uh, some people of um, colour had to leave the project because they thought, especially as people of colour, they would be even more visible and even more recognisable. And um, I think sex workers who took the risk and decided to stick with the project should be appreciated. But even more than that, I would like to extend my thanks to all the people who, like me, had to bail out uh, at some point um, just because they couldn't go with the project. Shall I talk about Leon here? Okay. <laughs> um, so some reference was made in the film um, to the Leon occupation. Uh, for those of you who aren't um, familiar with that, that was um, an occupation of uh, French churches in 1975, primarily in Lyon, um, but also uh, elsewhere in France. Um, and that was, we were thinking about that quite a lot when we were making the film, um, partly because, again, as was mentioned in the film, there's this kind of incredible 
um, documentary, like very raw documentary footage um, of of the occupation. And part of what goes on in that footage is, in fact, a discussion um, amongst sex workers of how difficult it is um, to speak safely. Um, and there's a kind of this whole like, series of negotiations that go on um, between and among the women in the church about appointing a spokeswoman um, so that she can give voice to their demands um, while most of them can stay hidden. Um, and I think also the other really interesting thing about the Leon occupation is that it was, um, well, there's loads of really interesting things, obviously, but it was born out of um, sex workers in France thinking quite hard about how they wanted to enact um, political change or make political demands um, while navigating the kind of dangers of visibility. Um, so a couple of years before, they had attempted to have a kind of street protest to protest the same issues, so police violence, police harassment, fines, uh, poverty. And they basically hadn't had a very good turnout um, because sex workers were so anxious about making themselves even more visible by protesting on the street. Um, so that was kind of, they were thinking about that and that was how the occupation of the churches uh, came about because they felt uh, like a very provocative statement, obviously, to have prostitutes occupying churches. Um, but simultaneously, uh, that, that kind of provocation made their protest very visible in a sense. Um, but also it meant that the media literally couldn't see in uh, and they could, they could send an appointed spokeswoman outside uh, to kind of deliver the demands um, but that they couldn't be seen. Um, so that, you know, that was kind of what we were thinking when we were um, kind of, because we had quite a fraught relationship with the building that we were in, the um, Scottish Trade Union Congress building, um, we were sort of thinking of it almost as um, this kind of occupation, um, sort of that allows you to kind of um, navigate carefully what parts of, of uh you know what how you make your demands visible and how how you stay hidden while doing that and also uh, i mean uh, but also what became fruitful from this challenge like uh, of not uh, making people visible is that uh which i thought was super interesting is like how do we make the politics visible but not necessarily individuals and i think that's a for me also a very political uh, aspect uh, of uh, filmmaking, so it's rather the politics that is underlying instead of individual uh, persons. So it also became very fruitful, I think, at least um, by working also with Scotland because of that. Yeah, right. It's about like struggling together um, rather than creating kind of star activists. It's about like, doing things collectively. Yeah. And I think one thing that came up like last night in your talk, Sylvia, which really connects to this is the importance of linking contemporary struggle to historic occupation or historic struggle. And I wondered if you wanted to say anything about a couple of things about visibility, first of all, because there's another side to visibility and also relates to the question of Lyon, you know, because um if I remember correctly, I think uh, the occupation of the church came after a number of murders. And uh, murders, they were caused by the fact that the police had prevented the you know, sex workers. At the time, the word sex work actually came out of the occupation. You know, when people in a way came out of the, of the, of the shallow, uh, the, the police was forcing uh, sex workers to further and further into the periphery of the town in areas they were not let out to make them invisible, right? Because it is supposed to be a disgrace to the city. And so this led to these murders. And that's what the, the women wanted to, to protest. And so that's so important, the question of decriminalization, because this is what is forcing the invisibility. Uh, about uh, yeah the, the historical background, I think uh, you know the historical background is is a history of, of real hypocrisy and and double talk because uh, in fact uh, more and more since uh, the beginning of capitalist society, you know women have been uh, 
actually uh, in many ways uh, forced to not only uh, accept all kinds of works in that and another, but also sell their bodies uh, because they've been so um, deprived of any resources that will give them other possibilities. And uh, of course, uh, this is at the time in which uh, you know the system begins to criminalize prostitution, and so there is a whole politics, you know, connected with the criminalization of sex work, which is very much related also to enforcing unpaid labor, to enforcing unpaid reproductive work, because you know the, the, there is a continuity between. Uh, the situation of women in the family and the situation of women the, you know, who do sex work outside of the family context. But it's been a really major investment in uh, you know, making invisible that connection. So I wonder, you, were talk you touched upon decriminalization. If maybe it obviously comes up in the film, but if we could maybe articulate this evening really you know, what, what that demand for de decriminalization means. Sure, I think that. <laughs> okay. Um, so decriminalization is a key demand of the sex worker rights movement. Um, and it means the removal of uh, criminal penalties around prostitution. Um, so they have uh, decriminalization in New Zealand. Um, they've had it since 2003. Um, it's uh, slightly um, complicated to talk about in a way because I feel like um, even in New Zealand it isn't perfect. Um, it doesn't go far enough in terms of uh, you're still not able to migrate to New Zealand and sell sex. Um, so migrant sex workers uh, largely aren't benefiting from decriminalization in New Zealand, uh, which is obviously like a pretty huge problem. Um, that being said, decriminalization um, itself is is still the aim. We just have to keep pushing on so that it includes all sex workers. Um, and what so in practice, it means that people can work on the streets um, without fearing arrest uh, of themselves or their clients. Um, it means that people can work in small groups um, of friends just to share share a flat for safety and to share costs. Um, and it means that where people do work for managers, uh, their managers are subject to labour law um, and kind of they, they have access to employment protections. Um, so the idea should be that decriminalisation um, takes power away from the police and power away from managers uh, and gives it to workers. I wonder if this is a good point to see if there's any questions from the audience. There's no mics for you, so you just need to object. Um, sorry, just to touch on that. Um, because of women, she will you be a bit more explicit about what the current situation is with working together with other sex workers and with managers and how that's criminalised? Sure. Um, so in the UK at present, uh, on the street, both um, sex workers and clients are criminalised. Um, for soliciting and curb crawling, respectively. Um, and then if you work indoors, if you're working alone, uh, that is legal. Um, but if you work with a friend, uh, then that puts you both foul of the brothel keeping law, which um, is written sufficiently broadly as to uh, criminalise uh, any sex workers who share a premises even if no one is managing anyone else, even if no one is making any money from anyone else. Um, so obviously that has a really negative impact on sex workers' safety because we're forced to choose between, on the one hand, working alone and being safe from arrest, but that makes us vulnerable to uh, violent clients, um, versus, on the other hand, uh, working with a friend, which makes us much safer from violent clients, uh, but obviously makes us vulnerable to arrest. Um, and that uh, fear of arrest obviously is kind of worsened for people who um, have uh, unsecure immigration status uh, or who are mothers. Um, so there's like lots of people have a lot to lose, not not only from um, from just being um, you know prosecuted for brothel keeping, but from everything that comes 
with that in terms of, you know, potential deportation, potential loss of child custody. Um, in terms of uh, when people currently work for managers, um, again, that workplace uh, is criminalised under brothel keeping law. Um, the work themselves isn't criminalised uh, in that arrangement, uh, but their manager is. Uh, and that means that um, workers in those premises have no access to employment law, um, they have no access to kind of standard health and safety regulations. Um, you know, if there's if your manager is abusive or exploitative, you have no way, like no way to seek redress around that, um, no way to organise in your workplace, um, because organising makes the workplace visible, and if you make the workplace visible, uh, then the cops will shut it down. Um, and if you need the job, which is presumably why you're turning up there, uh, you obviously don't want your workplace being shut down. I don't think many people are aware in that um, family members are also criminalized, so um, partners of sex workers can be um, prosecuted for living off the moral earnings, as can um, children, adult children of sex workers. So I think that's quite important as well, little known. So do we have any other questions? Yeah, it was a pleasure to watch the film. I wonder of all the panel, who else would you like to watch this film? I can start. We got this question earlier this uh, morning, uh, and we have maybe it's different answer depending on. So, I mean, I would love it for so the feminist, the larger feminist movement to watch it, uh, because I think it's so important to uh, to see uh, sex work also in relation to other forms of feminized labor and precarious labor, and in order to see the structure behind it. Uh, and I, I, and, uh, I mean, I would love that. And I, I think that one of the sources of inspiration uh, for this film uh, has been also Jean Dielman, made by Chantal Ackerman in 1975. Uh, and the character of Jean Dielman, uh, she embraces three characters. She's a mother, she's a homemaker, and she's a sex worker. And that film became so important in discussing the kind of invisibility of, of women's labor. And uh, one of our kind of... Uh, what we also been thinking is what is this contemporary John Dielman? And of course, but instead of just making the oppressive work invisible, it's also making the struggles visible. <laughs> uh, and I think that, that so I, I mean, I, I, personally, I would love that if we could have a uh, connect this to a larger feminism. Yeah. I think I personally would like um, sex workers uh, pretty much anywhere in the world to watch this film. Um, when we started, that was uh, one of the main um, aims for me. I think that as um, sex workers, we quite often feel isolated and it can feel that the problems that we have and the trials that we face, um, it's just us and nobody else understands us. And obviously this um, whole social media thing makes it uh, much easier for sex workers around the world to connect. But I understand that not all sex workers have access to social media or smartphones or even laptops. But if they could get together, you know, somewhere and just watch a film and see that other sex workers of maybe different colors have the same problems. Um, like, I know that I would really appreciate that, and I kind of hope that maybe sex workers elsewhere in the world would also like that. Yeah, I guess just to add to that, I'm part of the process of making this film in the early stages of thinking about what we could do, we, we together watched a lot of different films and got energy and inspiration from watching all kinds of things, including uh, the first one, uh, Sex Workers Unite, um, about a brothel um, setting up a, no, the strip club even. Um, trying to start a union in uh, San Francisco. Um, so I guess, yeah, just to add to that, it would be amazing if there are other people also taking inspiration from this film. Next year, the film will also um, be showing at Collective as part of an exhibition and also at Edith Ruiz House. Um, and we talked a lot about, I guess, the different audiences through those spaces that will encounter the work and how this if it works, that it can speak to sex workers, but also those that 
know very little about the sex worker rights movement. There's a question here. For the non-sex worker in the audience, what can people do to help the sex worker rights movement in Scotland gain progress and more, so more people fully understand what we mean by ECRIM and how bad it is? Maybe it's good to also explain what the Nordic model is. Um, thank you for that question. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, for those who uh, aren't sure, the Nordic model is another um, uh, phrase for a law that was also discussed a bit in the film, uh, which in the film we call End Demand. Um, it is uh, kind of marketed quite heavily as a kind of progressive feminist, uh, quote unquote, solution to prostitution. Um, it comes out of Sweden originally, Sweden implemented it in 1999. And what it does is it uh, criminalises the client, so the purchaser of sex, uh, and the manager. Um, it ostensibly decriminalises the seller, um, although in reality the sex worker uh, often remains criminalised. So, for instance, they implemented it recently in France, and although they repealed the uh, nationwide soliciting law, um, municipal or local soliciting laws are still in place. So, street based sex workers can still be criminalised um, through kind of uh, local bylaws. Um, it also retains criminalisation for sex worker in terms of if you're sharing a flat with a friend, you can still be uh, arrested and, and charged with brothel keeping for that. Um, and in fact, when the Nordic model comes in, it often ups uh, the penalties for that offence. Um, so that's a, a major problem with it. Um, another major problem with it is, as discussed in the film, it seeks to make sex workers poorer, which by definition makes us less safe. You know, it means that um, we're pushed to accept clients that we would otherwise perhaps be able to turn down. Um, it means that we're pushed to compromise on our safety strategies, our screening strategies, because uh, when clients are still on the ground, you'll do anything to keep the very few clients that are still there, even if they're saying, you know, um, I don't want to give you any screening information, just come to my hotel, blah, blah, blah. So... I sort of understand why people think that it is a feminist law. And I I see that it's counterintuitive um, that people think criminalising the client will reduce his power. But in reality, the economics of the sex industry, which is sex workers need to sell sex much more than a client needs to buy sex. So we need to struggle to keep, uh, to keep a client. We need to compromise to keep a client. The economics of the sex industry just mean that that actually worsens the power imbalance between sex workers and clients. It makes clients more powerful. So it's a, it's a really bad law. And as Carly said, uh, amazingly, the Scottish Labour uh, Women's Conference have just voted down a pro Nordic model motion, which is a surprise, but a nice surprise. We can all do with some nice surprises. And I think in general, if you're looking to support sex worker rights, you should try and bring a motion to your trade union uh, in support of DCRIM. Uh, there's a new organisation called UK DCRIM Now that's doing kind of nationwide lobbying and they have a model motion that you can bring to your trade union or if you're a member of the Labour Party to your CLP or if you're a member of some other political party to your local party. If I assume they're all democratic in the same way, I don't know. I'm obviously not an expert on this stuff. So, yeah, uh, any kind of democratic organisation that you're part of, try and bring a motion in support of DCRIM, in support of sex worker rights, uh, talk about sex worker rights in feminist spaces, in LGBTQ spaces, uh, get in touch with Scott Pep, um, <laughs> try and set up a direct debit to Scott Pep. We have no money. <laughs> um, anyone have anything to add? Right, uh, that's not so much about supporting sex workers' rights in Scotland as supporting sex workers in Scotland. Turn up to our event. Like, thank you for turning up today. Uh, but just so you know, 17th of December, uh, the International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers, our partner organization, Umbrella Lane, based in Glasgow, will have um, a vigil in some public place and I know that 17th of December is the sort of time where you really want to be at home shopping rather than outside in the rain, you know, morning sex workers that have been killed in the past year. Uh, but it makes us feel better and it also shows the world that there is more than just these three people who actually have the energy that people care. This really is important. Um, and I don't want to come across um, as a hippie. Um, or a hippie. 
Yeah. Um, but actually, uh, if you care for sex workers, consider supporting other things. If you support women's rights, you will be supporting sex workers. If you support disabled people's rights, you will be supporting sex workers. If you support people living with HIV, you will be supporting sex workers. If you support drug users, you will be supporting sex workers. If you support labor rights for migrant people, you will be supporting sex workers. There are numerous causes out there that you can support and you will still be supporting sex workers because sex workers are literally everywhere. We are everywhere. We are afraid to be very clear. I think there was another question over here. Hi, thank you very much for an important voicing. Um, so what I'd like to hear from you all about what thinkers and books that people should go away and tap into after they've been watching this film. <laughs> Read Molly Smith's Molly Smith and Juno Max book Watching Prostitutes. And this really is an amazing book. And definitely also read Sylvia Federici's work. It's been very important to us. And, and maybe um, one thing we wanted to speak to Sylvia about is, and it came up in your talk last night, is that um, all struggles need a reproductive structure. And I wondered if you would say something. Yeah, I was mentioning last night uh, that uh, you cannot really make a struggle, particularly in the long term, without having a reproductive structure. What I mean by that, it's a, you know, a way of organizing your day-to-day -day life that supports, supports the struggle. And that means, for example, really creating relationships among people, affective relationships, reorganizing the way you know, you reproduce, you know, your activities from cooking to, uh, you know, working together. And uh, I think that this is especially important, you know, for sex workers, you know, because so much of the condition of criminalization, you know, forces you to be invisible, to separate yourself. But I see that in the last decades, there have been some really important development. And uh, in different parts of the world, from Bolivia to Australia, to, there's now, for example, sex workers have been organized on a cooperative basis. Women working and living together to give themselves protection, you know, to share their the work, the struggle, and also to protect themselves. And I think, uh, you know, and so, um, it, it, and also to free themselves from the control you know, of proxies, from the control of pimps, from the control of uh, the, the sex industry. And so work in a more self-managed way. And I think that this is a very important direction. Petra, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add on that, because I know that this idea of connecting uh, sex work to other reproductive labour is really important when you're thinking about this. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think that's one been one of the um, crucial things that I learned both from your uh, writing as well as from your work. I have to say, and that is that what I also said, like you can't. First of all, you can't disconnect uh, sex work from other forms of feminized labor, and I think that was also an important aesthetic strategy in the film to to make that visual link uh, between these uh, different labors, but also to see. Exactly what you were saying also, but to see the reproductive labor as a crucial aspect of the struggles, which I also hope that it will come through, that they come through in the film and slowly you also realize that the reproductive labor that's being made is actually part of the struggle in itself. So uh, not only to make tea in order to, to feel comfortable, so actually to, <laughs> to, to, to kind of a teacups also become a, a resistance uh, towards those very structured, uh, so, and, uh, and I think that in all struggles, this kind of, uh, the notion of reproduction labor is super important. And I think this is also uh, what I also really learned from working together. So, uh, so definitely that's kind of been a crucial aspect of, of uh, or it's been crucial when we've been developing the film together and the script together, and that these things are kind of connected and you can't separate them. But it's also something that kind of keeps returning in, in 
works I do or works I address. I, I sometimes even think of reproductive labor is a, is a, it's crucial in, 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 uh, uh, kind of building up the, the possibility for a revolution, <laughs> but it's also crucial after the revolution. <laughs> so that's kind of like what, what is the basis for, for, for living and working together. It's very powerful in the movie to see precisely that aspect, you know, the women like cooking, making the tea, the cups, the arranging the room, putting up the painting, taking them off, etc., and seeing the kind of collective work, which is really the basis of solidarity. I think there's a question here. Thank you very much for the film and for helping to brave to be here. I have three questions, uh, two for the whole panel. Sorry. And one for Petra, the artist, and I start with the last, which is how would you discuss your film in terms of genre, let's say? Like, do you see that in terms of genre? Yes. Like, is it like, would you see the documentary, uh, something else? How does it intervene? And it's also why the decision to the title, you know, which is workers, rather than, you know, since we talked about visibility, rather than including sex in the title, like what is this decision, if it was your decision and not a collective one, what does it mean? Um, the other two questions, which is for everyone, is like there is, a, I'm sure you know that there is coming from, um, the capital is trying to auto, to produce automation in this profession. So like there is a new uh, role actually that I, I just read today that opened with sex dolls in Canada and it's like super successful. That's what I read. And I wanted to really to ask to what extent you, you are involved with this. I don't, I don't want to call it threat or whatever, like to, to your profession, but how do you see this? Because it's, it's a tendency in jobs that appears everywhere. And whether as an activist, uh, workers organization, you, you deal with that. And finally, uh, what is, who comes in the definition of the sex worker? And of course, I'm not referring to, to, uh, people who are migrants and, you know, want to enter the profession. But like in relation to trafficking for people who don't want to be in the profession, right? But are somehow for, for, for clients in many cases, they're the same. So how do we, do, who comes under the definition of a sex worker as opposed to something else? Okay. Thank you, Angela. Um, which question do you want to begin with the question about genre and the title of the film? Yeah. So genre. I'm not sure. <laughs> what do you think? I'm not sure it needs to be classified within a genre. Uh, Either, but I'm just saying how do you see it? Yeah, I'm, I, I, I think that what we've been doing is like really making a mongrel in the sense of we've been using, playing both with kind of feature film, fiction film strategies as well as documentary film strategies as well as kind of a inspiration from like a feminist uh, film tradition like Jean Dilma, you know, uh, where, for example, in Jean Dilma, you follow this super long takes, this character who, who does through kind of a reproductive labor. Uh, and it's almost in Jean Dilma, you almost experience it as real time. And I think, uh, I think when we develop the, the film together, it's, it's the, a lot of inspiration comes from the feminist uh, film tradition. So that I would say, and whether it's being classified as documentary or art film, I'm, I'm not sure it matters so much. Um, it's other things like the film essay, the advocacy, you know. Yeah, no, but, I, no, but I, I, I think it's really, I, we haven't talked about it in those terms at all. Uh, I think it kind of, a, it, it borrows strategies from different uh, film tradition, but definitely within a, a political feminist film tradition. Not maybe it's necessarily the essay film. But I, I, we did have a long debate whether it's a, we wanted an advocacy film or not. And I think we came to an agreement that it's, it, it was important to be able to, it doesn't have to have an impact tomorrow, but rather to add a complexity to that discussion. So, so that's kind of where we borrowed the strategies uh, from. And concerning the title, that's a collaborative, collective effort. And I, I think you, Molly, gave a beautiful reply this morning. So I actually think I will hand over to you when, uh, when it comes to that. Uh, well, one is in conversation with your previous work, uh, one of which was called Sisters. So it sort of echoes that. And also, I think there is a kind of sense of hope that maybe at some point people will be watching the film, not necessarily thinking that it was... Not, uh, not knowing already that it would be about sex work. Um, so just 
that that act would slowly become obvious over the course of the film. Um, but we didn't want to kind of set up a lot of preconceptions by making reference to sex work in the title. And obviously, like, you know, a pretty fundamental aspect of the film is that it's about work. Um, so that's really where the title came from. I also quite want to speak a little bit to the trafficking question, but does anyone else want to speak to that or to the other question? So, I mean, I think there's a lot of different things at play in your question, and I'm sort of, uh, this, I'm hesitating almost to know where to begin. I think the idea of trafficking is used in a kind of weird way um, as a rebuke to sex worker organising, um, which is obviously strange uh, because when other workers organise for better rights, it would be obvious that um, it wouldn't make sense to turn up and be like, your demand for rights somehow harms people who are being exploited. Because obviously, when you're demanding rights, by definition, you are aiming to reduce exploitation. It doesn't really kind of, yeah, I don't know, it doesn't compute. And other workers generally aren't asked to kind of account in, in that way um, for exploitation. Uh, I think also there's a tendency among sex workers to draw, to respond to that sense in which we're being kind of rebuked unfairly by drawing too sharp a line between sex workers and kind of the question of trafficking, uh, which I'm saying the question of because there's just so much in that word. Um, there's, you know, the state's definition, there's a kind of popular definition, there's exploitations, people actually experience it, which takes innumerable different forms. You know, so it's complicated. Uh, and I think that when sex workers say, you know, trafficking is nothing to do with us, that's also a problem because I think instead of saying that, we should be saying that the state is what creates the conditions that enable trafficking to happen through border enforcement, through immigration enforcement, and that as workers, whether documented or undocumented, we should all be struggling against that together. So when we say trafficking is totally different, there's a danger that we're saying you know, uh, raid and rescue is, would be bad for us. You know, the police, having, the police having more power over our lives would be bad. But there's this other group of workers for whom that's good. They, they want more police power over their lives. And actually, like, clearly that's not true. I don't think the police, police having more power over anyone's life is good. So I think, you know, that's, we need to kind of be uh, clear at saying um, that. Uh, when we're talking about trafficking, we're talking about conditions created and maintained by the state and various kinds of state violence. And we fight that by fighting uh, state power and state violence. And was your other question, Angela, about aut automation? Yeah. And in what way maybe Scott Pepp is involved in? Yeah, I asked for this of you on this because it's a trend that appears in many sectors in the economy and we see it also, apparently growing in sex work, so... I, 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 did, I did that. I did that. Because actually it's been a long time this has been talked about. The nurse bots, the love bots. In Japan, they've been experimenting with that for a long time. And first of all, one of those dolls costed, at that time, costed about forty to $50,000. So, one thing. But also, I don't think, I haven't seen uh, that kind of automation of reproductive work, of care work, taking place, even though there's many, many years that's been talked about. I really don't believe that that is, in fact, it's a reality. On a, it's, it's, yes, a kind of a, of a dream, I, the same way as a kind of, you know, uh, industrialized uterus. It's a dream for capitalism to have children produced from a sort of outside, technologically produced uterus. But I don't think they can actually achieve that yet. Yeah, I think um, the idea of automation uh, becomes this like distraction, really, in the conversation. Um, I think sex worker activists and sex workers are so overworked and tired with fighting injustice against like actual humans who sell sex that I just feel like completely. Like, I feel nothing about the idea of, like, hypothetical or even real robots. I just don't care. <laughs> Can I ask if the SEC have in any way kind of responded to the film? Or, and if they haven't, then 
either, depending on how you want to answer it, answer it what you think their response might be or what you hope they would. So the short answer is they haven't made a response to the work as yet. <laughs> um, and I guess one of the things that we talked about a lot in making this film was that actually it felt kind of difficult to fully pin down what the STC's current policy is on um, sex work. So although in 2013, the <coughs> then sex workers at the university were kicked out of the space, it's not clear exactly now what their policy, and I know there are some groups who come under the banner of the STC um, who are very much in solidarity with sex worker rights, but I don't think that is at all kind of unified within the union movement. And one of the things we were talking about yesterday is also the union formed in Spain and the then, I, I, I think someone else can probably speak more about what, what has then happened, even though this union is formed. But I think also another thing that I think also is, uh, uh, you also asked Harry what we want to hope to achieve or generate, and I think that one thing that I think has been interesting in uh, setting the whole film and within the S2C is that once you articulate uh, the possibility of sex workers occupying, becoming, a, seeing part of a labor movement, uh, it's also, it creates a political imaginary, but also that once you articulate it, it also becomes possible. So I think then the question is how how can we think of uh, uh, sex work in relation to uh, labor, uh, contemporary labor movement as well as historical labor movement? I, mean, I think that's quite present in the film. And I think this kind of articulation, the imaginary articulation is, for me, uh, it's been really, really, uh, it's, it's so important uh, also in working in films and, and using aesthetics. So, yeah, because once you said it, you can't, you can't silence it. Uh, it, it, it becomes a possibility. I think there was a question. Um, I quite agree with what you said about um, supporting the women's movement. Supporting the women's movement. Yeah, um, being supporting sex workers at the same time. But I'm interested that in what you'd say to Rape Crisis Scotland and Women's Aid Scotland, which are two of the biggest organisations supporting women victim of sexual violence, but who are both quite vehemently pro the Nordic and, and what you, I mean, I can guess, but like how you'd approach them to try and um, advocate for a change of opinion. So one of the problems is that there's a kind of circularity in Scottish policy making at the moment. So equally safe, which is the Scottish government's policy on violence against women and girls, uh, defines um, prostitution as a form of violence against women. And then organisations which draw their funding um, from the Scottish Government's funding stream uh, on violence against women and girls have to sign up to the uh, Scottish Government's definition and policy around violence against women and girls. So then there's, yeah, there's a kind of um, circularity where to be an organisation that gets that funding, you sort of have to agree with the definitions it already is. Obviously, that's not the only kind of problem. I think there is a kind of institutional or like government feminism or state feminism um, that's very kind of invested in state power and police power um, and that you definitely kind of see that in terms of the governance of those organisations to an extent. Obviously, they're really valuable organisations and they do amazing work, but like we also would be very critical of their policy around uh, sex work. And I think it's hopeful that I certainly perceive younger activists or like um, not not necessarily not in terms of age but in terms of positionality within the organization i feel like um activists and workers who are maybe not in kind of governance roles yet are largely pro decrim so potentially that's those organizations will change as uh, people kind of move up them in terms of seniority but, I mean, in general, I think just um, kind of affirming that we have a lot in common because we're all invested in the fight against patriarchy and the fight against sexual violence um, and just trying to, like, keep those lines of communication open and trying to work on things together where we can. I think 
um, kind of really productive feminist conversations happen around uh, like some shared struggles. So it's really striking to me that, for example, the Irish feminist movement seems, re- at least from a UK perspective, to be relatively good on trans issues and also relatively good on sex work. And I think part of that has to do with feminists working together on the repeal campaign and that made room for like lots of sex working feminisms and trans feminisms to kind of be heard within that struggle. Um, so yeah. I just wanted to add that as Molly highlighted, while um, a specific organization may have um, a policy that they um, have to stick to, it's not necessarily the view of the individual people within these organizations. Uh, there are many volunteers for Rape Crisis Scotland who uh, support sex workers completely, and I know many sex workers who have had very supportive encounters and found um, a lot of care and support at Rape Crisis Scotland. And, uh, but that, you know, while there are many individuals who um, support us, that, that doesn't mean that. Well, it's not just Rape Crisis Scotland and Women's Aid. There are plenty of other organisations in Scotland who work with women but can actually be very judgmental, even if their policy is about supporting sex workers. Um, so I think that when it comes down to actual experiences, that will always be individual rather than what's a policy of the organisation is. Can I follow up? Yeah, please do. Um, yeah, I'm asking as someone who Molly identified as someone in the lower echelons of rape crisis as a worker and as a volunteer who is pro decriminalization and is facing a lot of resistance um, from managerial positions. I feel confident saying that because I'm guessing no one in rape crisis hierarchy is here. So I'm not about to lose my job. Um, but I'm asking if any, Molly, I'm just reading Revolt of Prostitutes at the moment and um, the narrative about Scott Pair or about outspoken sex workers who are pro-discriminalisation not being representative by virtue of speaking out or being able to speak out. So it's very much alive and well. And any advice on, on how to have those conversations within, you know, like as a mark within my crisis would be <laughs> much appreciated. Awesome. Well, thank you for, um, well, for reading the book and also for like doing the work you do. Um, that's really appreciated. Yeah, I mean, I guess like just like continual emphasis on like the material harms that criminalization um like does to women who sell sex um particularly around like things like eviction and arrest under the brothel keeping laws and loss of child custody and deportation um because i mean when you're talking about like criminalization by soliciting law obviously the response will just be well under the Lloyd model we'll get rid of the soliciting law but under the Lloyd model all those things i just mentioned will be retained or worsened so I think, yeah, just kind of endlessly returning to, like, question whether those things, whether eviction and de- a deportation and arrest, well, keeping the loss of child custody, whether those things are beneficial for women who sell sex, because clearly <laughs> the answer will have to be that they're not. But, yeah, also um, maybe come and chat to me afterwards and we should swap email addresses and uh, we can, like, have a conversation about resources and stuff. So I think we have time for about three more questions. Um, Kirsten? Two questions. The first is a practical one. I was just wondering if you could speak a bit about this co-authorship model, this collaborative production model that you use um, to produce this film. Um, and then secondly, I wanted to ask a bit about this. Um, I think we all know how difficult it is to sustain any form of struggle, and of course it becomes yeah, harder when um, it, in such, under such intense conditions of precarity. Um, and Sylvia spoke really deeply yesterday about the importance of connecting different struggles in the field of reproduction. And I was wanting to get back to that earlier question just about the use of this film. And I, you know, I know that it's going to be shown in Germany next year as well at the same time. And clearly it needs to be shown in Spain at the moment as well. And I'm just wondering if you have any plans to use that film um, to sort of strengthen any connections you have with other sex worker led organisations in different countries as well. Petra, I wonder if you first want to speak about the co-authorship and that as a model. In a way, maybe it shouldn't be me speaking about it. I think that um, one of the things that is important for me as an artist, uh, filmmaker, uh, and also anchored in a feminist uh, tradition uh, or practice, is to 
see if one can actually give a form to a political struggle. And uh, and by saying, and when I say to give political form to, or to give form to a political struggle, you 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 have to, you cannot do it without being uh, either a part of that struggle or to become part of that struggle. Uh, and I think that it it's it has to be uh, collectively made or collaboratively made. That it's other anything is uh, uh, anything else would be actually out of the question. Uh, I I would become a filmmaker, someone who I don't want to be. Uh, so this, from the very very beginning, this was the the condition of uh, our work, I would say. And uh, according to my I mean, at least uh, as far as I could, I've been trying to make sure, from my perspective, that we ha- that we also do it collectively. So and and but I learned also lesson because I made a film called Sisters together with a organization called South for Black Sisters, which was uh, released in 2011. And uh, I claimed the whole time that we were made in collaboration, but on the contract level, it's me that has the rights. So uh, this time, uh, uh, it was crucial not to repeat that mistake. <laughs> so, so maybe to say, like, on a practical level, yeah. kind of, and as a producer working for the collective, what it meant to kind of create a space in which co-authorship could happen, I guess it's important to... Um, for us to uh, create kind of social spaces in which um, we could discuss ideas over a, quite a long period of time. And I, my role and that other producers really was a kind of reproductive work to generate this space where we could debate the script, watch films together, debate the direction uh, as, a, as a group. Yeah, I feel like Fran is slightly too modest to like um, put this as explicitly as maybe it should be put. But like basically, what uh, she should be saying is that like she in particular, representing Collective, did loads and loads of work that was really invaluable to making it um, making co-authorship possible. I just also like to say, um, in working on the film, um, Petra and Fran really created a safe space for us, and we never really knew what the film was going to be about until we created it. So, you know, it was very social as well, like Fred said. It was a, a social space where we could all get together and talk about our concerns, and it really just emerged in a super organic kind of way, which was, you know, we always felt the trust was built up over a long time, and, um, you know, we've all sort of become friends, very close friends in the making of it, which just really helped. And, um, for it to come out in a really authentic way. And we ate a lot together. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have about five minutes left, so maybe your other question was about um, how you sustain a struggle and also maybe the role of the film in that kind of sustaining struggle or connecting to other related struggles. And I don't know if anyone feels I can pick that up. It was really interesting, I think, something that Sylvia was talking about was about caring for each other, um, which is crucial to sustain, to sustaining a struggle. And through the whole process of this film, um, I think we all really felt supported and, and cared for. And I think this is also, uh, I mean, this is the very, very first uh, screening, and it's the first time people outside our uh, group is actually watching it. And one of, well, I've been so extremely nervous for today, and uh, I still am, uh, but one of the reasons is exactly this, where will it go? You know, we think this is a super important film. Will you or the world think the same, you know? And then, so, um, so this is also, uh, we already, when we were starting making it, as you, as you already said, we were imagining that it would both uh, uh, spread in the sex worker movement as well as in a, in a more artistic context. But this is like a, it's, it's even though we can work for that and try to make it happen, it's also to some extent beyond our control. So, and this I think is what also makes it this tension at the moment where it will go because I think it's important that it's being spread and that it was being spread in these different uh, networks and groups and as well as platforms. 
So thank you. I think that um, is time. And I just want to say, yeah, thank you all to the panel for your thoughts and for your time and for everyone for coming. You're welcome to join us at Harry's Bar if you want to continue these conversations and share a drink with us after the film. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for watching that with us today. I just want to take this moment to thank everyone who's been involved in this project. We've been working on it for three years, and it's been a huge effort and energy put in by very many people, many of whom can't be named personally tonight. But, yeah, I want to thank you all. I invite everyone who's been involved to stand up if you're happy to. Um, and I'm just going to thank everyone individually who's here today. So first of all, thanks to Petra Bauer. Petra Bauer is our wonderful director of photography who's here with Archie. Becky Thompson, our sound engineer. And Alan Hoover, our producer from Sweden. Petra Holtman, our assistant. James Bell, who's supported on sound. Georgia Horgan, our production assistant. May Redman, who made the digital artworks. Grace May, who paid Gray and Siobhan Carroll from Collective. Fiona Zardine, from who made the banner with us. And thank you, of course, to everyone from Scott Pep, who really we couldn't have done this without the guys Thank you also to all the supporters of this project, to Creative Scotland, to the Edith Risk House, and Edith Molnar, who is here tonight, the director, also to our research partner, the University of Edinburgh.